This is a demonstration of how we section maxilla and fin rays at the Marquette Fisheries Research Station. To section these structures, we use a Dremel tool with either these little metal circular saw blades or with Damascus separating discs. It's a matter of preference which ones you use. I use both, but most of the time I stick with the separating discs. I feel like they don't flex quite as much as the metal discs when you're cutting, um, resulting in a little bit more uh, square cuts on your sections. There are a lot of different um, designs for spine cutters that people use ranging from pretty simple uh, to fairly complex. A simple one would be just a Dremel tool mounted on a table where you run it uh, your structure through by hand or maybe just your Dremel tool mounted on the table with a simple carriage where you still hold it in place by hand. Uh, this is one of the more complex ones I've used. I borrowed this design from another office um, where I used one actually over in Newberry. There are advantages and disadvantages to each type of spine cutter. I think there are a couple, basically two main advantages to this one. One is that because you're clamping the structure in and running it through on this carriage, you never have to put your fingers anywhere near the blade when it's spinning, so it might be a little safer than some other ones. Uh, the other advantage, and I think it's the big one, is that because you're clamping the structure in and adjusting the thickness of the cut with the screw, you get a lot of consistency in this, um, the thickness of your sections within a sample and uh, between samples. Now, for example, when I do most of my sectioning, I'll clamp it in, make the first cut, and then turn the screw half a turn, make the cut, three quarters of a turn, and then five eighths of a turn for my three sections. And with most structures that I section, um, one of those three thicknesses will work for aging. Now, disadvantages, one would be that it's a little slower than more of a manual setup where you're just feeding them through by hand. Uh, with that type of setup, you can section a lot of structures really quickly. Um, the other disadvantage of this, if you look at a maxilla, you can see that they're slightly curved. Um, this system works great for flat structures like fin rays, but when you section a structure, you want the sections to be perpendicular to the bone, so straight across. So if I were to clamp this in flat, the blade would actually be crossing at a bit of an angle. Um, it's not a deal breaker when you age these sections. You can just hold them at a little bit of an angle with forceps and then be able to look straight down, down through them. But it would be a little more ideal if I had a setup where it could hold at whatever angle I want. So at some point in the future, I need to work on that. Um, I do have one workaround for larger maxilla like this one at work. I have a basically a set screw here, just a little wood screw. And if I unscrew it, it comes up, and then when I clamp the section in, it'll hold this end up so that this end is more perpendicular to the blade. However, that only works with the thicker, stronger bones. If I put a small maxill on there and try to do that, it would just break it. So it's pretty much limited to just using um, that method on the larger ones. Where to take sections out of the maxilla? Um, so this is a lake trout maxilla from the left side of the fish. The front of the bone is on this end. This would be the anterior end of the fish. This is the main portion where it actually attaches to the muscle. Uh, the back part, there's just a little membrane that attaches to the fish. This part right where it attaches to the fish, um, we call that the knuckle. It's where it really bends heavily to. What we do when we section these is we cut it off as close to the knuckle as possible and then we want to take our sections in the 25 percent um, anterior 25 percent most anterior end of the bone remaining so on this specific maxilla i would make the first cut right in this area uh, right in here and then take my three sections uh, just behind that so i will cut a couple sections uh, we have our spine cutter set up in a box with a dust collector. Um, breathing don't bone dust uh, isn't really good for you. And we have the dust collector vented directly outside, so all of the dust goes directly out of the building. Other thing, I always wear my safety glasses. We're dealing with a spinning blade that sometimes shatter. Also cutting off little parts of bone, so you want to make sure you don't get that stuff in your eyes.
also to section this one. I clamp it in, leaving enough out so there's enough space to take all of my sections. Uh, we want to make sure it's as perpendicular as possible to the blade, so I want that maxilla to be straight out. Adjust for my first cut, so cut it off as close as I can to the knuckle. Uh, for this first cut, I'll leave the dust collector off just so you can still hear me talk. So turn it on. <laughs> our three sections. We save the remaining portion of the maxilla just in case we need to take another cut. Later on if we don't like the sections we got, the knuckle, we don't use that for anything so we toss that. When I run them through on my step there is a little bit of play side to side. So I usually just push it sort of away from the saw and just run through really slowly. And the slower you go, um, the less likely it is to shoot the sections off um, into nowhere. Sometimes that still happens. If it does, I just take another one. But most of the time, if you just run it through really slow and try to stop right at the end, the sections drop down in the tray. Set up another one, perpendicular to the blade, set up the first cut, turn on the dust collector. Most of the time it ends up being the center one that I use, the 5 eighths or so, but from fish to fish that varies. To section fin rays, very similar. This one is actually from a Lake Whitefish. When we section these, we use pretty much the same method with fin rays from just about any fish. The white fish are pretty solid. When I do things like walleye, we don't want the first fin ray. A lot of times those get cut. Um, sometimes I just cut that one off because I'm not going to use it anyways. It's generally the second, third, or fourth one back that I use. Most of the time I focus on the third ray back. If these are really wide, if we took a lot more fin rays than what we need, usually I'll just cut the extra off because I'm not going to age those anyways. So for this one, I got rid of those and just kept the first five or so rays. This one's fairly flat on the bottom. Um, if you're careful when you put them in the envelope when they dry, you can keep them like that. But sometimes they form sort of a big triangle shape. When that happens, I take the first cut so that it's even with the bottom of the third ray. That way I'm getting a cut that's as close to the bottom as possible to the primary primary ray that I want to age. If you were just to come up and square the whole thing off, you end up with sections that are farther up the fin rays, and if you do that, you can miss out on annuli. So not too much of an issue with this one being flat, but what I will do with this one is the first cut I'll set up so that it cuts basically at the bottom of the third ray back, right in this area. Um, and then I'll do the same as what I did with the maxilla, which is half a turn, three quarters of a turn, five eighths of a turn. So I'll clamp it in so the rays are perpendicular to the blade. 
set for the first cut. <laughs> will often stick together right at the end which is fine you just pop them off after they're cut also like the maxilla I save the rest of the structure just in case I need to take another cut later do the same thing with this one there's a lot more there than I need Cut off the extra portion. Set up for my first cut. <laughs> how we section our maxilla and fin rays. If you're curious how this system works uh, with this screw adjusting the thickness of the cuts, uh, we can take the top off and take a look. So the screw is just the turnbuckle with the eye bolt on the other side removed. The turnbuckle is screwed down to this piece of wood underneath and then there are two screws holding the side pieces together so that when you screw the turnbuckle in or the eye bolt in it slides the arm to the left inside the turnbuckle there is a block of wood and a spring you need the spring inside to provide the tension to actually push the arm back um, without that spring if you turn this back it would just move the eye bolt out and the arm would be left in the same spot so when you turn it in you compress the spring and push the arms to the left. When you unscrew it, the spring is actually pushing the arms back to the right. <laughs> 